The upcoming Iranian presidential election is seen as a referendum on the country's nuclear deal with the rest of the world. But as Iranians get ready to vote for their next president, there are also other issues at stake. Hello, I'm Nathan King, sitting in for Anand Naidu, and this is The Heat. Again, campaigning officially got underway last Friday for Iran's May 19th presidential election. It comes at a time of rising tension in Syria and the broader Middle East and a new U.S. administration that's been openly critical of the Iran nuclear deal, but also Tehran's behavior in the region and beyond. Six candidates won the approval of the country's Guardian Council, a conservative watchdog group charged with vetting the candidates. Among them, conservative cleric Ibrahim Raisi, the favorite of the hardliners, and of course, Iran's current president, Hassan Rouhani. His re election could hinge on whether the country has seen enough economic benefits from its deal with the, with the rest of the world. There's much to talk about. Let's get right to our panel. Joining us from Tampa is Mohsen Milani. He's the executive director of the Center of Strategic and Diplomatic Studies at the University of South Florida. With us here in Washington is the founder and president of the National Iranian American. Council, Trita Parsi, and his latest book is entitled Losing an Enemy, Obama, Iran, and the Triumph of Diplomacy. And joining us from Boston is a former advisor to Iran's nuclear negotiating team, political scientist and author, Kaveh Afra Siabi. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, all of you. Let's start with uh, you, Kaveh. Uh, just explain to us, um, because it's probably one of the least talked about elections uh, around the world, just what sort of process we're going through now in terms of the presidential elections in Iran, and, and, and how uh, are the candidates picked? Well, you know, there is a vetting process yeah. by the 12-member Guardian Council half of whose members are lawyers, the other half theologians. The theologians picked by the supreme leader, the rest by the uh, Iranian parliament. And uh, this body uh, reviews the applications for, for the candidates and uh, filters them and settles on a handful, as we have seen, you know, this round six, the previous round eight, the one before that, four, and so on. Uh, and the purpose is to, you know, manage the process and have a rational, you know, electoral process that gives a pretty short duration for campaigning, actually, you know, barely over two weeks. Uh, the campaigning ends two days before the election, and the candidates are urged to avoid negative campaigning and and so on. Uh, and, uh, you know, this has been the case since the founding of the Islamic Republic. And uh, so far, uh, no incumbent president has mm. failed to get reelected for a second term. Uh, and I, you know, personally think that Mr. Rouhani has a very decent chance of uh, winning a second uh, second round of presidency. Thank, thank you, Trude. I, I want to bring you in here because it's quite incredible, the process. Uh, 1,636 ca candidates, even including 137 women, all, all apply to the Guardian Council. We only have six uh, left now. Obviously, Rouhani battling for a second term, but his, his major opponent is a bit of a surprise, right? Tell us about that. Well, the major opponent, well, as it's uh, explained right now, is Ebrahim Raisi, but he is someone who is rather unknown. He has only a recognition rate or, or familiarity rate of about 45 percent amongst the Iranian public. It is someone that the conservatives have actually very actively tried to lift up within the last six to nine months, but he doesn't have the name recognition, and this could definitely be to his detriment. But he does appear, or at least it is said that he has something else that, from his perspective, probably is a benefit. But historically, I think it is questionable if it is a benefit or not. That is that he's believed to be the favorite candidate of Ayatollah Khamenei. Now, if that is the case, then that may actually guarantee him the support of about 10 to 20 percent. But traditionally, when we take a look at it, the people who have been considered to be Khamenei's favorites have actually almost always lost the elections. And the Iranian public has been quite inclined towards voting for the anti-establishment figure. 
Uh, Mohsen, in, in Miami, um, Trina hits on a point here that Iranian elections are very unpredictable. Uh, uh, most people who, uh, from the outside, might think they are predictable. We have surprises uh, before. Is Rouhani a shoo-in, or the more conservative candidate uh, uh, going to cause an upset here? Uh, I think uh, Rouhani has a pretty good chance of winning re-election, but by no means this is a sure thing. It, number one, depends on the voter turnout. Usually we have about 56 to 60 percent voter turnout. The higher the voter turnout, uh, the more advantageous mm. it's going to be for Mr. Rouhani, especially if the voter turnout is high in the major urban areas, because that's where Rouhani's main constituency is. The second issue is whether the conservatives or the hardliners can unify their rank and allow only one candidate to run against uh, Rouhani. Uh, in that case, uh, the chances for uh, Rouhani's re-election would uh, uh, diminish significantly. But overall today, if you look at all the candidates, Rouhani has the best chance precisely because of what he has been able to achieve in the past four years, specifically in regards to signing a historic nuclear mm. agreement between Iran and six global powers. Well, most of pick up on that because, you know, Rouhani from the outside is seen as a very strong because of the nuclear deal as well and hundreds of millions and billions of dollars flowing back into Iran. But uh, the economy hasn't been great. And is, is that What's at stake here in this election, uh, um, uh, Kaveh? Is that what's at stake in this election? Uh, the economy? It's the economy stupid, as they would say over here? Well, definitely economy tops the agenda, but I would say that foreign policy is also important. And in my forthcoming book on the nuclear deal and the remaking of the Middle East, we devoted a good deal to the Iranian economic foreign diplomacy that has resulted in the signing of hundreds, if not many thousands, of uh, trade agreements with various states as well mm. as companies in Europe in particular. But the problem is that many of these agreements have remained on paper due principally to the hesitation of the uh, Western companies, for example, uh, with respect to the U.S.'s reaction, because, as you know, you know, there are still primary U.S. sanctions on Iran and the limitations with respect to monetary transactions that need to go through the, you know, U.S. banks in some cases. And as a result, the uh, net benefits of the nuclear agreement have started to trickle down. But I really think that since this is a long-term agreement, 10 years or mm. longer, it takes time. And Mr. Rouhani has an unfinished business with translating these harvests, economic harvests of the nuclear agreements, into tangi tangible benefits. And a second term will definitely stream him forward if the external environment is a stable, and hopefully that, re that will remain so. Is that right? Um, uh, does he deserve longer to, for these economic benefits to come through? Because the, the economy isn't great. Although we've seen GDP grow, what, between 7 and 7.5% 7 in the last year, it's mainly in the oil sector, isn't it? And exactly. unemployment's pretty high, what, 12 13%. So, I mean, is he failed on that? Even the Supreme Leader said something about it. Well, I, I think it's premature to say that he's failed, but if we compare it to any other place, if you mm. had an economy that is growing 7 or so percent, the IMF says that Iran is going to grow 6.6 percent, the incumbent would be a shoe-in. Right. But the fact that he is an a shoe-in is a result of something you hinted at. Most of this growth is in the oil sector, which means that it's going to the state and state-controlled companies. You're not seeing a significant growth in the private sector. Because for the private sector to grow, there actually needs to be investments. And the investments are not coming in, as Kava correctly pointed out, as a result of hesitation amongst Western companies, and particularly banks, fearing not the political risk in Iran as much as they're fearing the political risk in Washington out of the uncertainty that has been created with Donald Trump one day saying that Iran is living up to the agreement, only to turn around the next day and say, well, the U.S. may not live up to the agreement. We may walk out of the agreement. Uh, Mohsen, there seems to be some pent-up frustration amongst the Iranian people when it comes to where the fruits of uh, the economy are going. Uh, the oil sector, there's been criticism about corruption and the elites. 
So that brings us to another candidate uh, that didn't make it through, but uh, Ahmadinejad, uh, who obviously served two terms as well. Why, why do you think he applied, knowing that he probably wouldn't uh, get a ticket to run? Uh, is he still popular? Is his populism still popular in Iran? I think uh, his popularism is uh, alive and quite powerful. And the two main uh, hardline candidates are trying to uh, ride, uh, to uh, take advantage of that popularism. But I think Ahmadinejad knew very well that uh, the Guardian Council would have not, uh, would have disqualified him. I think the only reason why he did that, at least the main reason, is that he wanted to get some publicity and he wanted to make it uh, clearly, uh, uh, make it clear that he is still a major player uh, in Iranian politics. But the, the key issue, I think, that, that uh, the, our, uh, the other speakers talked about is the Iranian economy. I just want to make one important mm. point about the Iranian economy. Uh, although the performance of the economy has not been as, uh, as good as people expected that, I don't think the, econo the economy is going to play as big a role as people think it is, precisely because Rouhani can turn around and say that if we would not have had that nuclear agreement, right. the economic condition would have been even worse. Because the other candidates are extremely critical of the nuclear deal. And therefore, when we talk about the economic condition in Iran, we have to remember that people are going to think about the alternative. What would have happened? Where Iranian economy would have been? had we not had that nuclear agreement. Qu uh, quick quick follow-up on that, because um, there has been some criticism about foreign money coming in and it not actually helping. There's been a lot of talk in Iran, hasn't there, of sort of self-sufficiency and economic nationalism, almost a little bit like we've, we've seen elsewhere in the world. How's that playing in? Um, is there a sort of buyer's remorse about opening up? I don't think so. I don't think there is a buyer's remorse, at least on the part of most uh, Iranian voters. There might be some elements within the Islamic Republic uh, that uh, uh, oppose that. But overall, I think the Iranian population, which is a very dynamic, young, educated population, they want to open up Iran to the rest of the world. In fact, more than any other issue, even more important than the economy, even more important than the, uh, the, uh, the fate of the Iranian nuclear deal, is this question. Should Iran open itself up to the rest of the world? Mm. Is Iranian prosperity guaranteed if Iran becomes integrated into world economy? Or should Iran stay isolated, dedicated to its revolutionary message? I think those who favor opening up of, uh, of Iran will be winning the upcoming presidential election.